Welcome to the Beyond High Performance Podcast, featuring content and conversations from me, Jason Jaggard, along with our elite coaches at Novus Global, their high-performing clients, and the faculty at the Meta Performance Institute for Coaching. On this podcast, you'll hear some of the world's best executive coaches and high-performing leaders, artists, and athletes discuss how they continue to go beyond high performance in their lives and businesses. You watch Jerry Maguire and you watch uh, Ballers and you watch Tropic Thunder and you watch all these movies where <laughs> agents are kind of, you know, the, the people that play them are those sleazy guys. To be able to kind of invert that and yeah. what if that wasn't the case? Yeah. What would need to happen for that not to be the case? Yeah. And then who would I need to become to ensure that I am helping develop this type of business? So we're here, we're really excited to have Matt Hannaford with us, uh, one of uh, clients of Novus Global and his coach, Jason Jaggard and friend, uh, CEO of Novus Global as well. And so Matt, I, we could talk about coaching. I actually am really curious about your origin story more than anything else, because you're doing incredible things in the world of sports as an agent. Um, so let's kind of go back to the beginning. What, what was the kind of the very birthing point for you when you started to get interested in sports period? Like how did that come to be? Ooh, uh, I actually love having this conversation because as long as I can remember, um, sports has truly been kind of, you know, the biggest part of my life. Um, so I, I'm somebody who I grew up in Southern California. Um, you know, as a kid, I, the first sport I ever remember kind of participating in was actually surfing. If you can believe that. Um, yeah, just, you know, mom would bring me to Malibu, go to Zuma beach as a kid. Um, and then what started to kind of happen for me is, um, I started to really enjoy kind of this level of competition, not amongst other people, but really amongst myself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I remember vaguely as a kid, you know, mom and dad would take me to flag football. They would take me to baseball. And so I was this kid who really played every sport. And then the one sport that I truly started to love, believe it or not, was not baseball. It was hockey. Really? So, Yeah. Yeah, so I'm in Southern California at the time, and my sister is randomly at an ice rink taking, uh, which, yeah, Dan, you'll you'll obviously love this this portion of the conversation. <laughs> uh, she's taking um, figure skating lessons. And so to kill time, my sister's a year and a half older than me. To kill time, my mom's like, well, I'm not going to get you a babysitter, so what can I do for you? I'm going to get you hockey skates, and I'm just going to say, go get them. And so as my sister is kind of taking this lesson, I'm now off to the side falling all over the place and what was interesting is that first day being at the rink i remember they had hockey uh practice i want to say like coming in that night because as you know dan like getting getting ice time as a, as a hockey player it's either super early in the morning or like really yep. late at night and i remember yep. they were coming in and i see these guys that look absolutely gigantic in their pads yes. and i just remember telling my mom like what are they doing i want to be a part of that and i to be honest, like I'm like six years old. I'm not, I'm not wow. three, I'm not 10, I'm like six. So this is all being retold to me. And that's how I'm able to kind of articulate this to you. So um, what eventually happens from what my mom says, she signs me up for a team. So you gotta imagine, I know nothing about hockey. I'm terrible. Me and a bunch of other six year olds are now learning the game of hockey. Well, I took it and I ran with it. So I start to really kind of focus in on hockey being my sport. I started becoming part of the, um, the like the travel programs start traveling to Canada. Um, and so I'm thinking at this age, hockey's the way I'm going. Like if wow. I have one sport, hockey's the way to go. Dude. What's funny, and this is how life throws you curveballs. Um, my dad ends up getting transferred when I was 10 years old to Sacramento. Okay. So we end up moving to Sacramento. Um, you know, you can imagine a kid growing up, going surfing, playing hockey, being in Southern California. We, we drive to Sacramento and I'm, I'm now seeing horses and barns and I'm not sure like, you know, dad, what's going on, right? And um, the interesting part is I, I start to become a part of this community where baseball was huge, right? Yeah. And as you can imagine being in Sacramento, now there was no hockey. So I'm having to now drive to San Francisco to get ice time, which is over two and a half hours away. And so what starts to happen over the next several years is baseball starts to become a bigger part of my life and hockey becomes more and more difficult to kind of keep up with the level that I was at. And so very naturally my dad ended up pulling me aside one day as I was going into high school 
you know, just basically sitting me down saying, look, it's either hockey or it's all these other sports. But if you want to play high school basketball and football and baseball and these other things, we can't continue to sacrifice going to hockey. So I'm going to give it to you. It's your choice. What do you want to do? And I remember because I was going into high school, it was, you know, hockey in California, it's not a high school sport. So I'm not <laughs> hanging out with my friends. Yeah. And so I remember making the decision, no, I, I want to be able to kind of build this, this friend group in high school and be able to play with all my buddies. So, you know what, I'm done with hockey. So I walk away from hockey. And then at that point forward is when really baseball became kind of the thing for me. And it just so happened at the time that I was going to probably the best high school program in the state of California, arguably, and even the country. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but the high school that I went to actually has, has more major major league players than any other high school in the country, Wow, which is pretty crazy when you're talking a small yeah. high school in, in Northern California. Um, so that's kind of where it started. And then, yeah, things just, they took off from there. So did you, did you start off playing ball then in high school with the ambition of playing a professional? Was it something you wanted to do? Cause you were with such it, it obviously talented, I think back to my own journey of being around really talented athletes at a younger age. Like, is that something you aspire to become? I, I did. Um, I was realistic with myself though. I, I think for me, it was more about, I loved being an athlete. I loved the competition. Yeah. And so how can I figure out how to make this my thing? And very early in the, in my high school baseball career, I do remember seeing other guys that were better than me, but something happened and it's really kind of sat with me for the rest of my life since that point is because I wasn't one of the better kids and I was able to outwork kids and then become one of the better kids the following year. I saw the value of hard work, I right? See. And seeing it and really experiencing that emotion, right? Overcoming these obstacles and, and getting over some of these hurdles. Um, I, I think that feeling really just propelled me into, well, then how much more can I work in all these other things? So where early on in high school, I probably would have said, there's no way I'm going to go pro. Now I started to think, well, wait a minute, if I can work harder than everybody else, who knows what I'm capable of. And I'm only 15. So, you know, maybe I'll grow, maybe I'll get stronger by the time I'm 18, 19. And then you never know. Um, so again, I, I would say it started off really being kind of a, you know, a, a, a faraway dream that I didn't necessarily think I could achieve to make, you know, I started to taste it a little bit more and it certainly kind of filled me with a sense of excitement. So when, when, um, can you take us back in the story? Cause I'm curious about that moment when you decided to stop playing or when you, was there like a moment you realized, Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pursue the, the, the athletic side anymore, the sport itself, but pivoting into what you're doing now. So like, was that a moment or was that like a gradual shift? Uh, it was, it was, I, I would say both because it was gradual, but there became a point in time and it was actually after high school. So I ended up going to a junior college in Sacramento and I continued to play baseball and I stayed there for two years. I spent part of the time red shirting cause I ended up getting injured. But for me, I was, I was ready to kind of move on with my life, not necessarily wanting to give up baseball quite yet, but I was ready for something else. I needed a different challenge. And so I chose to go to long beach state partly for baseball partly because that's where my sister was going to school. And it was back in Southern California, which is again, where I spent 10 years of my life. And um, my, my plan at that point when I was leaving the junior college was I'm gonna go to Long Beach, I'm gonna play baseball, and I'm hopefully gonna outwork everybody. And then at that point, like we're gonna see what, what happens. What I didn't realize is when I stepped foot on campus at Long Beach, I had, because I went to this junior college that was one of the better programs, I mean, it was like a full-time job. And so stepping foot on this new campus, even though it was a new opportunity, I just felt like I, I don't feel like I should feel if I'm really going to be able to overcome the hurdles that lie in front of me. And so very quickly, I made the decision, you know, and it really stemmed from I don't want to be, let's just say, a 30 year old minor league free agent having to move on with his life. And then at that yeah. point, really going back and figuring out what's next for my life. So I very quickly said, I want to get ahead of the game. I know what sounds interesting to me. Yeah. And at the time, I, I, I was talking to some people who were telling me, hey, read some books about what a sports agent is. And when, the more I kind of dove into the idea of what that person was in a player's life, the more I, I appreciated and the more I felt like I could be good at it. 
So I started doing some homework on my end. And then at that point was introduced to a couple of the right people and just kind of ran with it. What, so what are you, some of those? Oh, ahead, oh, sorry, man. What, and you know, what's funny. We, uh, it's fun being on the other side of this, Dan, maybe like as a hand raising system or something. If, if there's, like I know, I know, I know. Right. I'm probably going to ask a similar question. Can I ask my question first? And if it yeah. is, yeah, sure. Okay. So I'm, I'm curious, like at that, I'm curious about the timing of that. So who, who did you starting started? Like, when did you start realizing, Oh, agent, that's a job I could do. Like, was that during college? Was that after college? And then who were the people who were kind of instrumental in that shift or informing you of that whole journey? So the, the first, there was two people that were extremely instrumental. The first was, so I had a teammate who was going through the process of being scouted and had questions as far as, you know, some of the things that he was being asked. Yeah. And he was really trying to evaluate, okay, like, you know, I have an opportunity to leave this junior college. And I guess I, I part of my answer to your question is it started at junior. So this specific guy was really trying to decide, do I go to a four year school after junior college? Or if I have an opportunity, do I sign a professional contract? And he poses the question to me. And at the time, this isn't my life. I'm not living this. And so I'm thinking, well, first off, I don't know the answer. I think it's a personal decision, but I wonder who's capable of giving this guy the advice that he needs in order to make the best decision possible for yes, himself. Yes. And so then that started leading me down this path of like, let me gather this information. And so the other person who was extremely instrumental was my brother-in-law who brings up randomly this idea of, Matt, I think you'd make a really, really good sports agent. And it was right around the time like Jerry Maguire, I want to say, had come out recently. <laughs> and so there certainly was this like this this uh, idea of what an agent was. And I think he just kind of said, hey, yeah, you know, very casually. I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about it. I think he just said, hey, I think he'd be good at that. And so I took that kind of to another level then and really just started reading books. But you got to remember, too, I'm still playing. So I'm like, mm. you know, wanting more than anything, wanting to kind of be prepared for what's next. And so because I had these books under my belt, I really, one of the things that I love the most is one of the books that I read talked a lot about, you have to work really, really hard. And again, going back to what happened yep. in high school, yeah. I took pride in that. Mm. And so I, I just kind of fell in love with this idea of, well, if this person has to be a hard worker, I excel in that area. So this is something I can now put my focus into. And then what can I make, you know, of this if that's what I choose to do? Yeah. Do you remember, by the way, Dan, I liked your question a lot better than the one that I'm about to ask now, but do you remember the books? Like, I, it, 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 it's funny to me, of course, there are books on how to be an agent, of course, but I, it would never dawned on me to think- To go read one. <laughs> yeah, there's like a sports, there's like a, in the library somewhere, there's like a section on sports agents and that you would like, you go there as a 19 year old and pulled from there. Like, what are the, what are the books? If someone's listening to this and maybe they're younger and they're thinking, I, I might want to be a sport agent. Like what, what books would you recommend they read? The, the most important book, I think any, you know, aspiring sports agent should read, especially in baseball. And really, I guess in, in any sport is a book. Um, a, it's basically by Marvin Miller, the old executive director of the MLBPA, the major league baseball players association. And this book is essentially the journey that he went through to really kind of create the MLBPA and all the challenges that were associated with that. And the reason I say that book is part of that story talks a lot about kind of the creation of free agency, but more importantly, the creation of sports agents and really the value that they provide and, and what the ultimate kind of the global goal is of all sports agents. And that is something that I think anybody who gets into this business needs to be reminded of all of the time. You know, that's an interesting thing. Two, two quick follow-ups and then Danny can kick me out whenever you want. But one is, it might be interesting for you to define what a sport agent is. But before you do that, because even like the creation of the free agent model, was it not always that way? Or was how was it before? What's his face? What did you say his name was? Marvin Miller. What was it like before Marvin came along? Was it not a free agency system? No, it wasn't. So these, these MLB owners and these teams essentially owned you, so to speak. So if you were a young player who um, graduates high school and you want to go play professional baseball, a team would sign you to a contract and they own you for the life of the contract. So they could sign you to a one-year deal and then guess what? They're going to sign you for another one-year deal. And so these guys essentially had all of the control. And so what started to happen, if you can imagine this, is imagine you signing a six-year contract with a team, right? 
And at the end of the six-year contract, there wasn't no free, there wasn't free agency rather. So the only team that could resign you was that one particular club. So they had and your Matt, rights essentially forever get go until they wanted them. No. And so wow. what these owners would do is, and this was, you got to remember too, like this wasn't 10 years ago. This was a long time ago to where like, yeah, this yeah, was yeah. kind of the nature of, of, of the world. Yeah. And so these players would go out there and let's just say you're a position player. Um, and you went out and you hit 30 home runs and you hit 300. Okay. And just to, to simplify things, yeah, if yeah. those were your stats and then the next year you hit 20 home runs and hit 250, you're getting a pay cut because your stats are worse than they were the year before. Interesting. Right? And there's only year long contracts. There's nothing long term at that point. At that point, and, and yeah, I, I couldn't tell you what the longest contract was, but essentially think about it from the standpoint of the owner has all the leverage. So are they yes. going to put a player in a position to be able to capitalize on it? No, they weren't. Yes. And so these wow. players were essentially, I mean, slaves to some degree. They had no options. They had. Yeah. had to just stick with this system. So um, you can imagine the first Miller comes comes around. I remember the year off the top of my head, but he comes around and he essentially educates these players so that they start to understand their value. And then they start to understand what 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 strategy could they employ to really take back some of the control. Yeah. And what is what is unique about that idea is I think that idea is more important today than it ever was before. Agents, players, everybody needs to be reminded that the that the control and the leverage rests not with teams, rests not with agents. It rests with players and it should rest with players. But I think sometimes people get um, carried away and they, and you know, and the, 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 the biggest challenge I think with the agent business is um, who do all agents want to help, right? They want to help their clients. And I think that's one of the problems because the focus shouldn't necessarily be on helping their clients. Their focus should be, we need to help all clients, all players, whether they're my clients or not. Right. So it's all, it's everybody needing to pull in the right direction. And again, going back to this book, to answer your question, Jason, that is why I think that book is so, so powerful for anybody who wants to get in the business. So I'm actually now a whole door is open for me as, as someone who works with professional athletes and multiple tiers of sports. So in different, different sports, I'm just like, so I'm, my mind's going to the players that I work with and I'm like, what are some of the mindsets or ways that players think that get in the way of them really committing to creating and owning their value that you see maybe predominantly in baseball, but I'm sure crosses over into other sports. So I think the biggest challenge for any player who is a, pro a professional is you can get really isolated and almost put up blinders, right? And the problem with doing that a lot of the time is you start naturally, you start to kind of internalize everything. And because of that, now you're looking at what you need to do. And instead of looking at it from a place of, I can overcome, I can accomplish this goal, you're almost looking at yourself like, I don't think I'm capable. Like there's this, there is this, this weakness that starts to kind of build within an individual that um, unless you're being surrounded by the right people that are kind of ensuring that you're, you're being honest with yourself, it can be very, very toxic and it can be very lonely. Can you say a little bit more about that specifically when you say isolating? What do you mean by that? So um, when you when and I'll compare it to college. When you're in college, it's a little bit like high school where you're surrounded by a bunch of teammates. You guys aren't making money playing the game of baseball. So there's not this level of competition amongst themselves. There is a little bit. Look, you're trying to play. You want to start. You want to make sure that you better your situation. But you're not it's battling still, over a job. You're not competing for cash in the room. It's still a game is what I'm trying to say. The minute you start to be paid for this business – you start to become, and, and to no fault of their own, it's easy to fall into this selfish mindset. And so having that selfish mindset all of a sudden starts changing. You're no longer looking at how can I like, how can I uh, improve all of our situations? You're looking at it from the standpoint of all that matters is myself right now. I don't care if we win. It's huh. more about how can I put myself in a good situation 
to yeah. take care of my family, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not blaming anybody for having this mindset. This is what is created. Yeah. And so to take that to another level, Jason, now you're looking at everything from that through that lens. Yeah. And now it becomes, this is all happening to me. I have nothing. Yes. To, it's, you know what I mean? And yes, then if you- Yeah, 100%. Yep. With, the, with the wrong player though, you almost have an inability to truly analyze how things actually are. And yeah. instead you're being, you're being manipulated by your own kind of false thinking. Um, well, and I see agents. So, and I have some relationships with different agents vicariously through players, but I see agents feeding that narrative, like actually feeding into that fear, feeding into that, um, you know, you need to look after you. Well, you just, that's it. There's no other agenda than that. I, I'm so, is that is that something that's rare, or do you think that's fairly common even in the no, that's, agency world? I think you're you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, that happens a lot. And one of the things that again, like Jason and I have have really kind of dove into this topic a lot because. Well, let me I let think, me back up for a second here. So sure. just for people who are listening, and we're talking about Matt and Matt Hannaford's journey into what he's doing now and, and, and becoming an incredibly successful agent in the baseball world. But there was a, there was a moment too, where you, you began working with Jason as your coach. And I'm excited to talk about that as we kind of go forward, but before we get there, Oh, Jay, do you want to say something? Go yeah. Ahead. Well, before that, just in terms of we're telling the story, you know, before Matt and I really connected, he, he had, and we said this at the top, I, th I think Dan's going to be the one who does the intro to this at the top of the, of the, of the show. I, Matt Hannifer really is a living, a living, breathing Jerry Maguire. You were existing at this <laughs> massive agency, and then you had this like moment of, of conscience, where you're like this, or, or maybe maybe we can ask him about that. Like, what was the buildup without and giving respect to obviously the environment you were in previously, but you know, I, it'd be interesting, Dan, to well, take us through that journey. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I want to hear about before we get to the coaching and how it's impacted things now. But I'm yeah. so so you start players start asking you questions. You get you get into the literature, you're reading, you're educating yourself, and you start you get your business degree, right? So you start pursuing this journey of being an agent. Just before that, because I've met got tons of people, tons, a few on one hand who I could count who have said, "I want to be an agent. This is what I'm committed to doing," and they they don't do anything. They don't they, maybe they work at the minor level. They never get into the professional level. So what was take us to the journey of like being interested in it and having guys talk to you to becoming you know, a part of a, a firm that generated over $1.7 billion in contracts. Like what was that journey like in a short kind of amount of time? Sure. So uh, I shared a little bit about how this question gets posed to me from a teammate. Um, and this really spurs some interest in me. Uh, the more I read these books, the more I really started to feel like, okay, wait a minute. So if I don't play this sport of baseball for the rest of my life, which is, that was my, my dream yep. at the time, this allows me an opportunity to take my strength but to still apply that, to apply those strengths to this business, right? To still stay in athletics, to stay in baseball, and and to be able to help players who are my friends, mm. just was a dream come true. And so the minute I stopped playing baseball, I did it knowing what then I wanted to do at that point. And so I ended up uh, hooking up with a company that was based in Beverly Hills. Uh, they represented, you know, Barry Bonds, Jose Canseco, Ricky Henderson, Mike Piazza. They represented a lot of really successful major league players. Um, I ended up becoming an intern for them. I stayed as an inter intern for about a year and a half. And again, you got to remember too, taking my mindset of I need to outwork everybody. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to college now. I'm interning pretty much seven days a week. I mean, I'm not going into the office on the weekends, but I'm I'm absolutely working on the weekends. And then I'm working at a restaurant in Long Beach to really just you know for some of my bills. And so I kind of, I changed everything in my life. So I changed my classes to all my classes so I can work in the office during the day. And I really focused on this thing of being an agent as this is going to be my thing. And so I just turned everything up a notch in my life. And I, I will tell you, self, like admittedly, I went too far. I mean, I fully oh. was like, I was on the phone 24 seven. I was trying to show <laughs> these guys that I could be, you know, everything that they needed. Yeah. And then I ended up staying with that company for close to 10 years in 2010 left, helped co-found a company, um, you know, where we represented Albert Pujols and Manny Machado and Fernando Tatis and, and all of these guys and, um, stayed there until last, uh, essentially end of October, beginning of November. And, and then I launched my own firm. Wow. 
I just, I, first of all, there's, <laughs> it's funny because you just said it in such a short amount of time. I was like, yeah, 10 years, huge company, rose up, then I found another one and then rose up. And then now I, so like, there's so much more to the story than that. But, but I actually am curious because there's an evolution that I hear, and we were talking about it earlier, uh, that you've gone through, even in the, the way you see your role as an agent and the way you see the work of an agent. So um, maybe, maybe to pivot into that a little bit, when, can you tell us a little bit about when you connected with Jason? How did you meet him? And what began to shift at that point in your life? Because it seems like you guys crossed paths at, a, at the right time, maybe is the way to say it, or at a time in which your life was, yeah, you go ahead. Unquestionably. Um, to tell a little bit prior to me getting into how, how and when I met Jason, I will honestly tell you, I had to go through the my my education in this business in this specific way for me to end up in this place that I'm at today. Interesting. When I started as a, you know, I'm in college at the time interning, you know, I'm I'm 19, 20 years old, right? Yeah. And I really served as the friend, the buddy, uh kind of the what what I would call like a backup guy or an assistant to a lot of these players. And I, I, I took pride in the job to the point where I started to kind of serve in that role for every one of our clients at that time. So, I mean, you're talking over 250 to 300 clients I'm doing this for, wow. and I'm absolutely loving it, right? And so to, to, to be able to kind of experience that ultimately led me to realize, okay, wait a minute, this isn't the right way. It is impossible for any human being, even if you got 50 of them, yeah. To truly be that for every player, there are limitations yeah. to having that many clients, right? And so I saw it firsthand. And so then when we co-founded the, or when I co-founded the second company, our focus at that point became, we are going to do things on a much smaller level, but for a, a, a very, very high level of clientele, mm -hmm. right? And that was our focus and that what we want, that's what we wanted to create. And then I felt that that company was falling into some of the same same pitfalls that the prior company was, hmm. right? And so to kind of see this evolution, it really became so apparent to me, well, what was the end goal? If the end goal for any agent is to either put money in their pocket, to continue just to get more and more clients, if it's at all about yourself, it is never going to work. Hmm. You can make it look good for a period of time, it is just not gonna work because eventually, you're going to show your skirt. You're eventually going to be seen for what you really are, right? And so I get introduced to Jason, funny enough, kind of through my wife yeah. who worked with Jason, but also through some mutual friends. And it wasn't the perfect time because us just being able to kind of have these conversations about what I was experiencing at the time, um, it was almost therapeutic. And at the time, it was really his friends before we started working together. It was therapeutic getting his perspective. Yeah. From someone who's been in the business world, who's obviously been successful at building the company. Um, I, I see a lot of similarities in our businesses. Right. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it just I was leaning on this person who kind of became my friend, but also my mentor. And so the, when the opportunity presented itself for me to work with them, it was a no brainer. I am curious um, about a couple of things related to. So there's a paradox that you a paradoxical thinking that I think you're introducing to the conversation that seems counterintuitive, I think, for most people. And it's this idea that um, uh, being in it for yourself <laughs> creates a barrier to what you really want to achieve. And I, most people I meet don't realize that. Uh, they, don't, they don't even think that way. They think, you know, I need to look out for me. And, you know, if I don't take care of me, no one will. So I'm just curious, Matt, like, it seems like that's been in you for some time. Like, where do you think that came from? Because it speaks to a lot of the work we do in coaching, but I, like, where did that start? Like, is that something somebody told you or was it always there? No. So I, I personally, I think for me, it was experiencing the opposite of that, having to hmm. uh, be at a place uh, that didn't believe that. And at the time being somebody young in the business who felt like I, like, I can't control this. I'm trying to build a name in the business. I'm, I'm learning as I'm as I'm going whether I agree with this or not and really having to kind of fight through that you know it sits with you yeah. and the minute you have an opportunity to kind of put your stake in the ground and change things you like for me it was a no but I have to take this opportunity 
And yeah. so it was something that kind of built over time, but I don't know if I would have ever gotten to that place unless I experienced the opposite of that. Huh. And I think like for me personally, what's important to think about is you have to look at it from kind of a global level. Let's take a step back and generally look at name one person out there in the business world who solely does things for their own benefit. Are they truly happy? Sure, they can convince themselves that they're happy in the moment, but are they? is that real happiness that they're experiencing? And so for me, as I kind of look at this business, it's, and this is why I, I, I lean on this idea of not just our players, all players, right? The goal for all agents should be continuing to kind of elevate players and give them an opportunity to really be empowered through this process. Not just if they're, you know, if they're fortunate enough to be represented by me, I'll do it. But if they're represented by somebody else, they don't deserve that. I, I think that is a crazy thought. Hmm. And so I'm more leaning into this idea of, and I, I'm sure plenty of people will say, you're absolutely crazy. And probably some of my competitors will say, you're, you're out of your mind. That's not this business. Well, yeah. why isn't it? It should be. It should well, be Matt, this business. Matt, I, I'm curious what you think of this because – what you're saying about the world of agents and agencies is actually, I've thought a lot about this in terms of the context, the context of competitive teams. And I think about players who are in a room together who are fighting each other for work, essentially fighting each other for positions rather than seeing that. And you see this in championship teams, there's a brotherhood, there's a camaraderie, there's a genuine concern for the other in those teams, not every team, but especially those teams, I think that go a little distance and win multiple championships. I don't know if that's true across all sports, but I'm curious to, do you think you're right? These ideas that you're talking about in terms of the eight, the world of agencies apply in like the clubhouse or the locker room with, with teams themselves. Um, I think they apply. I don't know because I haven't been in a big league clubhouse recently. I don't know if I think it exists in a winning team. That's what I would say. In a well, winning I just want team, to slow I, that down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> say more about that. <laughs> I think I think for a team that has a certain level of success, yeah. there needs to be this. Is it possible for a team to win one time and be the alternative? Sure. It's possible that there's a team that could win the World Series, and you know what? They're in the right place at the right time. They're, all their players were you know, in a bottle. hot at the yeah. moment. That's right. But is yeah. that a t is that the Chicago Bulls when they won all those championships? Absolutely not. Like Jason brought this up in one of our coaching sessions. We were talking about the book Tribal Leadership, which has been amazing for me to kind of dive in and, and, and dissect. But I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, Jason, and you can correct me, it was like either Steve Kerr or somebody like that who was basically articulating that they weren't they weren't playing the game of basketball. But they weren't competing against these other – they weren't trying to beat these other teams. They were like living on an alter, alternative universe, playing with themselves this other game. It, it was like yeah. totally separate. And I think about that. And if, if – I think that that possibility exists through every business. And I think the agent business is no different. Yeah, no, I I, um, I, I love hearing you, your thoughts on this because – of all the industries that I've, and especially with the work that we do with Nova Global, Nova's Global Sport, and you know we're connected to players and then their agents, kind of, I, I, I see the need for a, a major disruption in that industry, uh, and I know that's something you're committed to doing. So why don't we go into this next piece of the story? So I'm curious. You meet Jason. The timing seems really well. What were some of the kind of initial conversations that you had, um, and and what how did that affect the trajectory of what you're doing now? So I think something that I absolutely unquestionably benefited from was Jason's really, really impressive ability to ask very pointed questions at the most uncomfortable time. Hmm. And it forces you to kind of push the brakes and to say, there's a reason why he's asking me this question. It's not enough for me just to give the quick answer. I need to truly dive into this and think about it. Do you, and remember, the thing, uh, do you remember an example of something like that? I know I put you on the spot a little bit, but. Um, for me, I don't remember a specific question, but I remember he held me accountable at a level that I didn't even understand what it was. Ah. And 
I initially, the way that I felt when, and I'll take accountability as an example, the way that I felt when he would make me feel accountable was I hate him. I don't like that he's making me feel this way. This is uncomfortable. Like there's no getting out of this. I can't just make up an excuse. He, like this guy will not, like if I go into a session with him and I try to talk myself out of answering his question, we will spend the entire time on this one thing until I admit it. <laughs> well, you, you know what's interesting about that is I'm thinking, I'm trying to remember, I think in the early, at the beginning of the contract, there was a little bit of us uh, of us getting a feel for how you can get the most out of this. And I think like like really creating a space where you were acclimating to the intensity of, yeah. of, of the conversation. What's interesting about that is I forgot about that until you mm -hmm. just mentioned it now. What I would say now is that you have really stepped into that and that you actually show up in a way that invites me to do my best. It's been a really fun transition to see you kind of get your sea legs and then and then do what you do in every area of your life, which is then show up 110%. That's been really, I forgot that that was a process. Well, and what, what's what been so, um, I guess the word that comes to mind is like pleasant to experience through this process for me has been, um, and I think I may have mentioned it to you yesterday, in fact, is there's a way of being that I think is contagious and, and people have this ability. And I think Jason has this ability where he brings all of himself to these, to these sessions. And it causes me to truly elevate and really put myself in his shoes as if I was him, but in my business. Got and it. so he'll say these things that I think a lot of people, and I've been, I've been, you know, the victim of this for a long time in this business where your initial reaction to somebody telling you something about the business you're in is, yeah, but that's not how my business works. Hmm. Yeah, yep. but that'll never work here. And it's so easy. It's like this crutch that you can just lean on and then nothing ever gets done. And so he caused me, and I don't know if this was something that he intentionally did or just him being who he is forced me to think this way. He caused me to really adopt this way of thinking as if what it would like the intuitive fence. But what if it was possible? Hmm. Yeah. You think it's not, and you're not even assuming like the idea in your head is, is, is out the window simply because it's just not in your realm of possibility. But hmm. what if it was, and, and what would that look like? Yeah, yeah. Like the, there's a, there's a commitment and actually uh, to opening up yourself it's almost there's an arrogance that we all live inside of this idea that we know exactly what is possible, what isn't possible. And to have someone poke at that can be offensive, but it sounds like you moved from that of like that being offended maybe in those moments to being curious and open. So Jay, I want to pivot to you for a second. Like uh, it's obvious, Matt, like I'm listening to Matt talk. I'm like, this is, Matt's an ideal client. Like I can just hear it in the way he talks mm -hmm. and, and some of that's your fault. So I'm curious, like what, what lights you up about Matt? And what, what has excited you about working with Matt over this past period of time together? Well, you know, I'll be honest. I was a little nervous to coach him. And I think if, if a coach is listening to this, they're going to hear Matt's intensity. They're going to hear yes. he speaks with such clarity and with such, mm -hmm. with such certainty. And, some t and that's a gift, by the way. And I really enjoy that about him. I'm excited for him to have a broader media presence and to... to to get his name and face out there in that regard, I think I think he's just captivating to listen to. And sometimes that that certainty and that way of speaking belies like a positionness of thinking. And so when him and I started tussling in the early days, I was like, oh, is this frankly, is this guy coachable? Because he he comes across like he knows what he's doing and that what he's doing is always right. Now what was interesting about that is uh, once we and like very quickly, as I started poking and like pushing and disrupting and inviting him to, to disrupt himself was how, how wrong I was about that assumption wow. that beneath yeah. that polish and that poise and that well-spokenness is a person who is really innovative and really creative and really eager to see things from multiple perspectives. And I, I was going to mention this briefly you know, and, and there's not like a good or, or bad way to do this, but some people, when they work with a coach, like if they work with Dan or other people in our firm, um, what they really need help with is dreaming. Like they, they, and they're, they're positioned and they're right in this because they believe that there, that there are no other dreams. And so what, what partly what we do is we come in and we facilitate them learning how to dream. And that's a really beautiful, if they're up for it, sometimes people are just going to be stuck in their rightness, but like, it's a really beautiful thing to help a person learn how to dream. 
Matt wasn't like that. He's he fits another category of client, and both can be ideal clients, but whether they're willing to play or not. But Matt already had a dream. Matt had a sense and an ache and a desire. I didn't. I didn't. Him and I didn't work together because he was bored. We didn't work together because he was looking for someone to kick his ass. He he was kicking his own ass, and he was looking for someone to help him do it in a way that created new results for himself. And I think that's what made a really ideal client. You can sense his work ethic. You can sense yes. his drive. Yep. He just needed somebody to help him throw some nitrous in that gas tank and then see what happens. Yeah. Is that? Does that? You all hear Jason breaking up then. Um, yeah. I didn't hear him breaking up at all, Matthew. I did a little bit, but I, I, yeah, but I, it wasn't bad. I mean, I, I, I could follow. Yeah. It was just a, um, it was a, a minor well, I'll ask a, I'll ask a follow up question. Actually, so I'm just curious, Matt, like hearing Jason say that, does that land with you the same way? Like, do you think that's a, <laughs> do you disagree with what Jason just said? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, what's, what's funny when, when I, think about and and Jason I appreciate everything you said it's interesting I've always wondered like does he enjoy working with me am I like <laughs> am I good to work with him am I not so it's nice that we finally can have that conversation yeah, yeah. It, only, it only took us doing a podcast to actually get you heard it, it, you which is you extremely heard it here problematic it's yeah. like you heard it here first folks we're gonna have like a boring reveal <laughs> what you really think <laughs> about your coach you know what's great about it? it? It actually lends itself to really both he and my personality where it's like neither one of us will say, hey, so by the way, how are things? Do you like working with me? Do you not? We're just like, don't ask the question. Yeah. Don't do it. Just well, just keep going. Well, yeah. probably what we, do, what we do is if we're feeling insecure, we just try harder. And I think yeah. both yeah. of us yeah. just really tried hard to serve each, for serve each other. I will say too, Dan, one of the reasons why I've really enjoyed working with Matt, and again, this isn't just flattery. This is you know, for people who are listening to this, who are a coach or in management or in development and serving people, and I think Matt's in this same as well. You know, when you meet someone where your values resonate, you know, so we talk a lot yeah. in the firm about how uh, we really want to serve, like we want to help people. We want to, yeah. we want to see. We have a dream where everyone in the world has a noble coach in their lives, helping them explore their potential, and and, and not just in a performance way, but in a moral way, helping them become extraordinary people. You know, Matt, that resonates with Matt, and Matt's Matt's dream of i love that phrase that you said matt you know not just for my players but for all players like that should have a trademark next to it that that is a beautiful dream of serving these wonderful human beings who happen to have this genetic talent that they've cultivated and worked really hard for and that their lives matter and and that the industry shouldn't be designed to exploit them but rather to enhance them so that they can be a gift to the world and not only be focused on themselves i think that's a really that's a really compelling and captivating dream. And so it's really fun. You can imagine it's really fun helping a guy win who wants to make the world a better place and who has the drive and the talent to do it. If, if, uh, if for all players isn't on your website yet, like put it on there. That's all I could think right. about when Jason was talking. <laughs> yeah. but, um, I, so Matt, like as you begin to look into the future of what you're building now, um, tell, tell me, Take me into like take me ten years into the future of what what you hope will happen in your industry. What will what will be transformed as a result of what you're up to right now? So let me say one thing about what I think where we're headed, unless things change. Yep. And then I'll get to where I think I'm going to hopefully take this thing, or yep. to improve my language, where I'll take this thing. Yeah, nice. um, <laughs> so I think I think that. This business hasn't changed in a, in close to thirty years, right? There there are way more agents than there ever were, but the goal for agents seems to me, and now I've worked at several different companies or a couple different companies, it seems to all be the same, right? It's a matter of you know we all want to say we're the best, we all want to point to the four or five superstars that we represent, and we need to convince you the player that we're actually the ones that do it right, but I also need to convince you that everybody else is wrong. Hmm. And I find that extremely flawed in so many ways. Hmm. You don't ever meet other agents that will ever say anything positive about another agent. To me, that's absolutely crazy. Hmm. And so just from the standpoint of like a general human being and interaction that you're gonna have with another human being, regardless, agent, player, whatever, am I capable of being able to compliment a competitor, I am, and I'm not insecure to do that. Hmm. And the direction I'm gonna take this thing is one where 
I want to make, and this is actually really funny to, to come out and say, but if my education and level of commitment to providing the players the information in order to rebalance the leverage in this game mm. from stopping it agents but delivering it to the player, okay? If I can follow through on that and the outcome is agents now become obsolete because frankly, players don't need them anymore because they're, they're equipped with all the information they need, great. Then we're success. And that is, it is so crazy and foreign to even be able to say that because I've lived in a world for the last 20 years in this business where why would you ever say that? But that is why I think there's such a big problem in the agent business because it's not about actually doing the right work for the player. It's about doing the work for the player for your player. Hmm. As long as he's your player. Yeah, it's almost as if there's a shift from just from purely just player advocacy to player education and player empowerment. Because what I'm I'm wrapping my mind around this as you're sharing, Matt, like. It, there's there's a there's a kind of advocacy that weakens the person that you're advocating for, and I think that we see that yeah. uh, it, it, that's a phenomenon we see in several different domains is when to say hey I'm advocating for so and so yeah but are you doing it in a way that actually helps them become stronger or are you doing it in a way that kind of silos them and isolates them well, creates make, a level of dis dependency on the agent or on the per like I noticed that too I see that happening yeah. yeah that's exactly right and what I hear you saying is you want to advocate in a way that empowers. And the so in some ways the success, the evidence of success is they they need you less for the things that they they used to need an agent for, right? And that which shifts how they how you partner together, which is exciting because it allows the player to to really grow their skills outside just the game of sport. Well, it's it's funny too, Matt, because even when I when I'm at the beginning of our conversation, you started to talk about like the role that you were playing for some of the players and also what players need and loneliness. And it just, it just really resonated with me as a, as a, as a coach of many professional athletes on, on that side of the game and helping them navigate those conversations, honestly, like keeping them rooted in reality rather than the sycophantic kind of culture that can be created around an athlete where they're just being told everything they're doing is great <laughs> and, and really become so kind of caved in on themselves that they don't see clearly anymore. Um, I, I'm curious. I'm just curious about one thing as we've been talking about this. Do you, as you were progressing in the coaching, this is a coaching question, as you were progressing in the coaching, did the coaching shift something significant at all in terms of your plans or maybe like how did it impact the, because you this this was a dream you had. It was inside you. It was being birthed. It was there before Jason ever showed up. Um, but but I want to know like how the coaching impacted the, the uh, maybe the, that the period of, you know, like the toddler years that we're in right now or the infancy years that we're in right now um, of the dream that you've been creating. So I think what it did more than anything is it, it he changed me, mm -hmm. right? And the way he changed me was I was having early on in the coaching sessions, it was me needing to be in this appointment with Jason or the session with Jason to then tell him something, then he would tell me something and then I would learn my lesson. And it, <laughs> it, it became this place where, I was having these conversations with myself as if I was talking to Jason and I knew what his answer would be. And then I would convince myself it needs to happen now. Hmm. So it's like I was having these mini sessions with myself that in the beginning, I mean, it, it, I, I didn't, I needed to kind of experience him in, in that way to, to learn. But once I got it, you know, he said to me one time, he goes, Matt, let me, let me tell you how to get the most out of me. Hmm. Yeah. And like that blew my mind. Right. Because if I can apply that way of thinking into my business player, yeah. let me tell you how to get the most out of me. Right. It, it now becomes instead of an agent being so terrified to be fired. Now it becomes I'm providing a level of service to this guy where I am. I am elevating that level of service because I am guiding him into hey, you're not utilizing me in this, these ways. And you should. Mm -hmm. I know what you want to accomplish. You should take advantage of this, but I need your input in order to provide that for you. Yeah, yeah, that's powerful. Well, even a few things I remember you telling me, and we can take my name out of it to make it less me centric. But you, so you know, you'd say like you've got a little Jason on your shoulder, you've got a little coach on your shoulder, or even you've got you have like your morning your morning 
launch pad hour and you i forget what you called it you had a jason jason jagger execution hour <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah literally to this day it's still in my calendar every Just morning like, get her done get her done That's yeah it. do it now well that was and we worked together too because he noticed that he had a and i think a lot of people including me have this in our lives we have like reflexive ways of starting our day and as Matt and I worked together, he realized, oh, wow, there's some missed opportunity there. I can really design and have Jason hold it, hold me to give an account for really launching my day in a really powerful way. As yeah. he, you know, I don't recommend everyone naming it after their coach necessarily, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it I think, that, and, yeah, like, right. And <laughs> it, was a, yeah. <laughs> it was, well, and I think that speaks to your, and I think about my coach, you know, I worked with a guy named Steve Hardison for about a year and a half, maybe two years. And it was, it was very similar. Like I've got, I got like a WWSD. What would Steve do? I pick up his way of being. And we were talking about that, Matt, last night. Like I, I've picked up his way of being and I, and I wear that now and it expands my life. And it's yeah. really gratifying to hear Matt say, yeah, Jason, I pick up your way of being. And like to know that whatever part of me that is helpful for Matt, he gets to kind of pick and choose and put on the parts that work. And then that gets to impact the way that he serves his clients and his athletes. Now, actually, Matt, I want to ask you, um, your athletes, because you've got some pretty impressive people uh, who you get to serve right now. And um, I'm curious, how are they feeling about this new model? What, what, do, what are the current people you work with? How do they feel about it? What do they, what do they say about you when you're not there? What's well, been really, really experience. Um, and remember, I, I had left the company prior, so I know you learn a lot after you leave a company what the clients actually think of you, right? And they're more open and, and you know, they're gonna share with you kind of some of their feedback or some of their thoughts. The nice thing about the feedback that I've received is they have recognized within me a shift in my being, hmm. Hmm. right? And I think that comes from a place of having, I carried this weight for so long where it was like, I, you know, I wanted to do this thing that I believed was right, but it was impossible, right? And to now be able to just make these decisions and do this stuff, knowing full well that it's for the benefit of the players themselves long term, hmm. I think, yeah, I think they've they, it's rubbed off on them. Yeah, you know, that's exciting. Um, yeah, it's it's incredible. I mean, I wake up every day now just absolutely alive. Well, that and that rubs off on your on your players. Absolutely. Go ahead, Dan. Sorry. No, I, I, um, it's funny. Cause as you're talking, I'm just noticing this is like, I'm coaching myself in real time here. Just the balm of what you're saying on, on the internal motivation of even what I do and what we do. Like it's so easy, I think for agents, for people just in jobs or in relationships to get caught in this trap of, if I don't look after me, no one will. Hmm. And it seems like there's a commitment. What does not seem like you're doing this? Like there's a commitment to to really um, serving, serving your clients and, and trusting that that, yeah, leading into that will provide what you need. Um, and, and that's, a, a, that feels like a riskier way to live, but I, I'm thinking about Kevin Carroll, uh, Jason, who was on a podcast recently, um, did an episode with Jason on the Metal Performance Show. Fantastic guy. He's a good friend, dear friend of, of our organization. And Kevin said the same thing to me. He was like, Hey man, like, he, he never, it's, it just blows my mind how little he's interested in discussing what he gets out of something. Um, uh, and, and, and yet he's so prolific and Matt, I like, I'm feeling that radiating off you in the conversation. And it's such a, it, it's convicting for me to hear, but also, it also reminds me that I think I'm on the right path. Like, I think I'm I on love the right that. Course. So you I know what's been, gift. what's been really, really, uh, enjoyable, um, uh, to, 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 to just chew on an experience is, and it, the business that I'm in has been known to be kind of a sleazy business. And, you know, you watch Jerry Maguire and you watch uh, Ballers and you watch Tropic Thunder and you watch all these movies <laughs> where agents are kind of, you know, the, the people that play them are those sleazy guys. To be able to kind of invert that. And yeah. what if that wasn't the case? Yeah. What would need to happen for that not to be the case? Yeah. And then who would I need to become to ensure that I am helping develop this type of business? And I mean, look, it's not anything that's going to happen overnight, but I think like I am so committed to it that that is why I just, it's why I can't stop talking about it. 
Well, and Matt, uh, the question Matt just said, if you're listening as a coach or somebody who's interested in just developing yourself, Matt asked the question, who do I need to become? Which is such a fascinating question to open your mind up to because a lot of people don't ask themselves or they don't even believe they could become anything other than they are or where they're at or the way they show up. Hmm. And, and your story is one of transformation, like from being a certain person to being somebody else and to the point where you're people around you are saying they're experiencing that difference in being. So do you, I'm curious, this is like a little bit different question, but how has that shaped your relationship with your wife? Oh, that's, we need like two hours <laughs> to talk about that. Um, I mean, I can tell you that I am way more present now than I've ever been. Wow. Uh, I, I think we, we've all met people who always, when you're, when you're with them, you're like, oh, babe, they're not really here, right? Yeah, I feel like their minds in all these other places. I think I was that person for a pretty long time in our relationship. Um, and it, it, it was, again, I think me wrestling with all this different stuff. And now I'm kind of sitting with this, this belief, this passion, this drive that I have, and I'm able to put all of my being into it. I think naturally she, I mean, she's the one that probably benefits more than anybody. I just, yeah. I, I At least that's what, that's what I tell myself in my head. <laughs> I wish you get her on and ask her, right? Well, and you know, it was her, and this is such a funny thing to say. It was her idea for us to work together. True. Um, that might've been strategic. That I, might've been yeah, like a brilliant wanna, move. Yeah. I don't want to say that like, you know, she was like, I'm happy or something, but it was very much like a, Hey, I, I think she, I think for her not to put too many words in her mouth, but I think it was like, I, I would love for Matt to have the same experience as me. I'd like to share like for us to share this, I think he'd really create a lot of value. Matt's the kind of guy that's going to get a lot out of anything that he does. And I think she was excited for him to be in the same space, for us to be in the same space together, just to see what happens to the to the kind of person that Matt is when we, when, again, when we throw some nitrous in the tank. That was exactly what she said, by the way. So, yeah. to a T. Nice. <laughs> Nailed it. it. Nailed so, it. So, <laughs> we did, yeah. Um so Matt, I'm like, man, there's so many more questions I could ask you about. I know we're coming up on time. So I, I am curious, um, as you begin to, let, well, let, let me ask you this question. If somebody is considering, or like maybe they've never worked with a coach before. And I like, I, I mean this when I say it, like our goal is not that people would become clients of our company, but that would go find a coach or someone to advocate for uh, a holistic development and healthy life that expands uh, rather than contracts right yeah. so yeah. Um, but if somebody's listening to this and they're like trying to figure out you know coaching who should i hire um do, what advice would you give them like in terms of finding a coach yeah so i to anybody who let's just say is is somebody who reads a lot who thinks hey you know what i work hard enough i read enough books i don't need a coach what are they going to tell me that i don't already know or can't don't have access to or can't figure out myself mm -hmm. i was that guy I really was. I, I always, I, my wife would get mad because I'd buy too many books and I would just, you know, I'm trying to teach myself how things work. The value that I found in having a coach was the accountability and the, and being able to have this person who is completely unbiased, who's only there to serve you. Mm -hmm. Right. So anybody who, um, is reluctant for any reason, I mean, I can tell you that there is no world in which my business at the world in which I would be as not committed, but as clear with my level of commitment with this vision. If I hadn't had Jason, I can honestly tell you that. Um, well, and I would say too, hearing you say that there's something really powerful and nuclear and almost spiritual about either asking for help or receiving help. And it yeah. can be so uncomfortable. And, <laughs> and I feel like if you talk, if you meet a successful person, they're only successful because other people have helped them in their success. And I think one of the, what's interesting about coaching is it's like, it's like going to the gym for, for learning how to receive. And I think Matt has been really fantastic as a client and learning how to, to take my affirming of him and my, uh, serving him as best I can and creating as as powerful of a space as I can as I can attempt to, and learning how to receive that and learning how to embrace it and learning how to and then even like I think frankly Matt as I as I get excited about your future, you know the as 
you learning how to say, here's what I want to do. I know I can't do it alone. Who do I need to reach out to? Who do I need to ask for help for? Who do I need to, like, that's such a, such a foreign language to people who are so good at just like going and reading the books and doing it on their own. And I really want to affirm Matt's ability. And even as, you know, our contract is ending in a month, as, as he, as he moves into the for into the future to continue to believe that there are, there are people who are talented and wise and resourceful and have resources who would be thrilled to partner with Matt and advocate if only he would have the courage to ask and to grow and to continue to be worthy of helping. And I think yeah. that that's a big, a big piece of our work. And it's fun to see him just lean into that and to, to watch the world conspire for his success. It's been a really, mm. it's been a treat. I love that. So, so here's the, here's maybe the final two questions because we're just at time. Um, I want to know what you want to say or what like you have a message for players. Oh, if, if you could just have two minutes and you're, you could speak to every player in the league right now, what would you say to them? I would say that um, I, I know their pain and their frustration. Um, the way that it is today is not the way that it needs to be. Um, you know, there, there certainly is a way for all of their, uh, ambition and dreams. And I'm not even talking about on the baseball field to yep. in, in a funny way, as Jason just articulated that there is that same human being out there for players. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think a lot of players have people in their corner who do really, really good work. I'm not the only one, mm-hmm. but I think we collectively as a group need to get back to kind of elevating each other and creating an environment that is more about the whole rather than just the individual. Yeah. Um, and and so, that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to create. So here's my question. Would you say the same thing to agents or would you, would the message be a little different to the agents? It'd be exactly the same. Okay. That's all. I, I mean, I, I want to be somebody who has the courage to stand in front of another agent and to compliment them. And right now, that is that is a foreign language. Yeah, well, and, and I want to I want to really be clear to people listening. Like Matt has conquered uh, the world of the agent. Like you've you've been a part of the biggest companies with the biggest deals. You've climbed Mount Everest, and you got to the top in the thin air. And looked around and go, hey, this isn't actually how this is supposed to work. There's there's another higher peak. There's a more challenging summit to go find, and so. Um, uh, what, what I find more inspiring than anything is when I meet someone who's already achieved quote unquote greatness in the eyes of others and is still not satisfied in a healthy way and wants to pursue that next level of growth. And, um, so Matt, you just listening to you has been such a treat today. I want to thank you for your time and for Jason, for being here as well. Uh, it's just been a real privilege to, to sit on this, uh, conversation uh, together. So, yeah, thanks, Matt. I appreciate both of you guys.